basically what we're gonna talk about is who we are, a little bit about what we do ourselves, some of our goals for the network, some of our challenges, high level discussion of what we've got going on in the network here, and just have a, a basically a Q&A. We wanna get feedback from the audience to really understand what you would like us to do, where you want us to go, things you'd like us to see, or like to have us do. Has anybody heard about this? It's a new meme we're starting. It's called Pentest John. Enables SSH, can't get in. All right, so let's uh, start off with uh, Heather, who's gonna be introducing Lockheed. Hi, um, I'm Heather. I'm also representing Lockheed today. Uh, some of you, if you've gone to the DEF CON networking site and seen some of the updates and the graphs, um, he is the, the mastermind behind creating that content and keeping that up to date. Um, Lockheed has been with DEF CON since, I believe, DC3, um, and he's been running the network. He is the uh, primary lead for the network team, and I am the second. Um, he also built the mobile agenda. I'm not sure if any of you used that this year, but it was on both. Uh, it was up both this year and last year. Uh, pretty, pretty handy, uh, you know, quick reference guide. And I've been with DefCon since DC9, so this is about my tenth year. And I do a lot of the tactical operations on the ground. All right. So next would be Mac. Yep. I'm Mac. Uh, I handle a large part of the wired infrastructure and servers and services for the network. Um, make sure that the baseline connectivity is there, uh, uplinks, you know, wired jacks for the speakers, goons, uh, vendors, contests, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Oh, I'm, and I'm Video Man. Um, I've been doing this since DEF CON 6, basically. It's been really fun and challenging seeing things uh, grow over the years. You know, we went from an infrastructure at the Alexis Park where literally we would get up on roofs and run cable, you know, in 100 degree weather uh, or run cables across the parking lot. And, you know, seeing this network mature and seeing it grow into what it is today has been really fun, really great. Um, and hopefully it provides value to the conference attendees. Yeah, for, for sure, it's definitely provided value from the perspective that, you know, updates.defcon.org, how many people use that site? A few of you? Okay. I mean, that's the info booth. They set that up, they come in and, and do that, and we provide the network for that. If that network wasn't there, that wouldn't be there. All right, um, next, Louise. I'm Luis. I've been doing the wireless network here for, I think this is my sixth year. So have done one year at the Alexis Park, another year, or all the years at the Riviera, and now we're here. Uh, Derek. I'm Derek. I'm the guy who runs DCTV. Uh, I've been with DEF CON since DEF CON. Oh. Oh. So, so out of curiosity, how many of your drunk, uh, hungover asses were sitting in bed watching DCTV this morning? I just want to see a show of hands. Yeah, That's yeah. awesome. Okay. Sorry for the outage. That one so, was my fault. Not DCTV's his. changed a lot over the years, especially the ones where we didn't have it. Um, and uh, it's been a long time since we had all the pure analog balance and old analog cameras switching over to uh, what we have now. We're now running MPEG-4 over IP uh, over a 4,000-foot fiber trunk all the way to the cable TV head end. Uh, in the other total end of the building. So uh, that was a bit of a challenge to set up. We had a lot of last minute changes to the infrastructure, but it looks like it worked out pretty good. Uh, special thanks to the Sound and Knowledge folks. They helped pull it together. Yeah. Yes, okay. props to Sound and Knowledge. Sparky. <clears throat> um, my name is Michael or Sparky. Uh, I guess I'm essentially the uh, DC tech for the knock. Um, everything you see taped to the floor, my blood, sweat, and tears went into that fine, fine work. Um, yeah, uh, resident bartender. Um, yeah, that's about it. I've been with DEF CON since DEF CON 8. Without Sparky, there would be no network. <clears throat> Ripshi, who is down at the end. Yes, my name is Ribshi. Um, my responsibilities basically are very similar to Sparky's. We run as a team, we run around, we make sure everything is working at the last minute, um, do repairs if necessary, tack down the table, put in switches, anything you guys need, we make sure it happens. All right. 
And Eric, who's a new addition to our team. Hey. Hello. Um, I'm Eric, and what I've been doing all along this week is to try to ensure you have the wireless coverage and, and reachable for, for almost all the time. So he lost 10 pounds to yep. walk through, through the whole week, pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah. That's a lot of weight for a little man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, so basically, Louise and Eric um, are in charge of the wireless infrastructure. And you know, we arrived on site on Sunday and started setting up the infrastructure. And a few arrived on Saturday as well. But Louise and Eric actually go through and, and started reassigning all the access points. We, we did a little bit of an upgrade we'll talk about a little bit later. And, they're, they're that team. Uh, the last person on the list is Tease, who is actually wasn't able to join us. He, he just got a new job, which is good, um, but unfortunately couldn't take the time off. But what he does is a lot of the, the content updates. So yeah, we've got the mobile edition, me.defcon.org, that he helped put together. Uh, he's helped with a lot of our maintenance of our wiki that we're using. Um, what else, what other duties has he, has he put together? I think that's... General cable bitch. Yeah. <laughs> General bitch. <laughs> All right. So what is the network, right? Some of our goals is reliable connectivity. You know, if you're going to come to a network or come to a conference and have a network connection, it needs to be somewhat reliable. Um, Secure-ish, because we don't know if someone has a zero day for the wireless network, right? Uh, we say secure-ish because now we have uh, WPA with uh, enterprise management on it, basically allows you to log into that. Um, how many people here actually created a login before they came? Yeah. All right, how did you find out about it? Twitter. Twitter. Was that primary? All right. That, then that's great, because that's something that, that we've kind of used a, as, a, as a team. If we know something, we try and tweet it out like, hey, go do this. And then usually someone retweets it for us, which is good. I was going to say, we also pay attention to the Twitter stream a lot, you know, so if you know, some people are complaining about particular problems in an area or something. That's one of the ways we've been trying. You know, that's our poor man's ticketing system. <laughs> so uh, the other thing, um, does anybody remember at the Alexis Park, I think it was the first or second year, uh, basically Ghent, who is no longer with the team, um, due to, well, anyway, um, he brought along a switch from one of his, his, uh, his work like a, what was it, a 4,000 4, or 6,000 series switch. And we went, oh, we've got, you know, 100 and some odd ports. Let's plug them all in. So we plugged all the ports in, made all the ports in the, the conference center active. And what you'd have happen is people would come along and plug in and go, oh, I can get access here. Great. And then people would be like, oh, do you have a hub or a switch? Oh, sure. They'd plug that in. And all of a sudden, you'd have this train of people going down the hall. <laughs> it, was, it was kind of funny. I mean, cool, but funny. Except for um, to the fire marshal. Yeah, yeah. So the fire marshal, uh, I don't know if anybody remembers that, but we had problems with the fire marshal at the Alexis Park. And so we said, okay, we can't do this. People need to, to be able to, to be mobile and be able to get access. Um, so at, at that point, we started really deploying a wireless network. Um, you know, the wireless network at that time was in no way secure at all. Uh, it was all just open wireless access points. Um, and so basically, all right, let's work towards something that, that people can get any access to anywhere. Uh, the other thing, we have a boatload of segmentation. Um, we have speakers, press, uh, all the, the speaking tracks. So like this podium has its own VLAN, has its own network. Each of the, the five tracks that we have out there have their own VLAN. Um, we decided to change that up. Last year it was one VLAN for all the speaking tracks, and then someone decided to do some man in the middle uh, on the speaker network, and we're like, yeah, maybe we should change that. So we did. Um, you know, it's, it's constantly a growing process, a learning process, and you know, that, that's really what this is about. But um, right now, I think we're at 199 VLANs that we've configured on the back end. So, I mean, that's pretty cool. Um, what is it, uh, 140 are for wireless? 140 yeah. are for wireless, and 59 are for uh, All the various wired things. drops. Of, and we had 69 actual drops into the spaces, so only 10 of those drops shared uh, VLAN segmentation with anybody else. Yeah, and th those are primarily the contest 
And unless we get a specific requirement that it needs to be on its own network, we kind of say, all right, maybe some people can share. It reduces the load that we have. I, oh, I, I don't know what our backend switches can hold off the top of my head. It's like 300 VLANs, I think, is what we max out at. But yeah. All right, so some of our challenges. I mean, we don't have an infinite budget, right? We, we actually, I mean, when we started out doing this, we said, all right, what can we get off of eBay? What do we have that we can borrow? Um, and that worked out well for quite a while. Um, unfortunately, we can't go borrow Aruba controllers because sometimes they're in use. Well, most of the time they're in use. Um, so what was that, DEF CON 13? 13. 13, that we, we actually went out and purchased the, the wireless controller, the Aruba wireless controller, primarily because it would have some IDS in, built into it, you know, intrusion detection, be able to, to, to detect rogue APs, um, I think that was the year that there was some contest that was doing something in the, in the contest area, like a king of the hill access point or something. And <clears throat> we would see it and we'd DOS it and we'd say, all right, no, it's not on the network. Gone. You know, five minutes later, the access point would disappear. And the next day it would show up again. We're like, come on, guys. And uh, finally, at Sunday afternoon, I think they came back into the knock and we're like, yeah, we, you know, we tried to do this contest, but unfortunately our access point kept dying. We're like, oh, yeah, that was us. <laughs> so coordination also helps with us. Um, hotel, does anybody want to speak about the hotel? Sure, um, are, are you looking for space usage or, you know? The, the, the logistics here. Yeah, I, you know, the, obviously you've been walking the half a kilometer back and forth through the convention space so you know what the walk is like. Um, actually, I think the space this year is incredible. Um, our wireless um, design has improved greatly uh, just, just due to the way that we've been able to use the space. Um, the hotel staff are fantastic. Uh, we've had just a great partnership with them this year. And while we had a good partnership with the Riviera, uh, things are just really smooth here. And, you know, frankly, it's a, it's a, a nice way to transition into a new hotel. Um, we have, um, and I don't know if you want me to get into this right now, but we have uh, better bandwidth options here. Um, they have metro area ethernet here, so we have some flexibility to, you know, move up in bandwidth. Uh, the infrastructure itself, while different from the Riviera, is, has worked out well for our needs. And really, it seems like even uh, the traffic flow has been better for, uh, for the humans, so. So the other thing is, um when we were at the Alexis Park, it was a non-union hotel, which meant uh, we would grab a cherry picker and literally at like 3 o'clock in the morning be driving around the hotel spaces, driving this cherry picker, going, zip tying the access points, running the cable down. We all did that. Like, everybody pitched in. You know, we'd get the network set up just before the attendees would come in because we really didn't have the space beforehand. Um, but when dealing with uh, union hotels, we now can't touch certain things. Um, you know, the lighting grid, you know, electrical things, hanging things on ceilings, hanging things on walls, sometimes has to be done by a, a, a union staff. So that, that in itself was also a challenge for us because we didn't think like that. We had to change our, our way that we were dealing with the hotel. Um, the infrastructure here, Mac, do you want to talk about the fiber? Yeah, so um, moving, back, moving from the Riv to the Rio is really, it, it is a different you know, stage of, of uh, hardware infrastructure, uh, different level of IDFs, different connectivity between them. Um, here we have a lot more option, you know, well, actually we have the same option, but it's a standard option. There's fiber between everything. Um, versus at the Rio, we actually had some fiber patches, we had some copper patches, we had some long range ethernet patches, which were um, very yeah, interesting to some of the spaces. The yeah, sorry, at the Riv. Um, so it's here. It's, it's very different. I mean, we, you know, the hotel is just significantly different from that standpoint. Um, in general, you know, one of the things that we have to consider with our infrastructure is it has to be spun up and, and torn down in a matter of days, and it's only used once a year. So we tend to, you know, going back to the money item, we tend to, you know, get what we can, but we can't really justify something because we're not seeing a 360-day use out of it. So 
a lot of our infrastructure tends to be fairly, you know, uh, fairly older equipment. We're still getting stuff off eBay. There's certain, you know, purchases which we make of newer gear just for targeted applications. The Aruba, uh, the core for to a certain degree, and a lot of stuff like that. Um, but you know, we have, you know, sitting in our sitting as part of our infrastructure. Um, I keep looking at this and I want to say, here's what our infrastructure is versus here's the challenges. We're going to go over the actual infrastructure in a bit. So I'll leave that. So <clears throat> uh, bandwidth, we actually have 100 megs bandwidth this year. Yeah. Uh, it's a metro area ethernet. It's that's, not a, not a Wi-Fi the, point to point. So I was going to say, so that's the uplink we have is 100 meg. Um, between all of the IDFs and, you know, to, the, to the Aruba gear, et cetera, we're sitting on gig backbones. Um, you know, we could argue, hey, we should have more, but realistically, looking at some of the graphic trends, or looking at some of the traffic trends, uh, we haven't really been pushing more than a couple hundred meg. Uh, so it's, I mean, I think it's high for a, con uh, for a convention usage, but it's not high for an overall usage, especially compared to the gear we have. I remember a couple of years ago, there was uh, Dave Bullock, whose photos are in uh, a lot of these here, but Dave Bullock did an article on the DEF CON network, and in the comments below, people are like, oh, why don't you have gigabit? Because at CCC, we have 10 gig. Wait a minute, we don't need 10 gig. We can't justify it. We have to be able to justify what we're going to pay for. And you know, they, in Europe, they may actually have uh, companies that will donate bandwidth to them. We don't have that luxury. I mean, we're in a hotel, we have to pay the proper channels and get the proper things. Uh, Encore is actually the one who provided that to us, so, as and a convention. When we say justify it, we're talking about you guys. You're really what justify it. So if, you know, you find something you want to use more bandwidth for, outside of torrenting, because a lot of people just see that as not easily justified. But if you have some really applications, something you want to play with and test with here, no? This is a good network to do it on. So think about that, especially for next year. And, and the other thing that, that I think we kind of have to dispel is the, the rumor that, oh, don't go on the DEF CON network, because you'll get hacked, right? Because if, if you don't use the, the network, we don't justify that we can add more bandwidth, that we can add more things. So it, it's kind of a chicken and egg. All right. That's my job, so keep pulling down stuff, would you? <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's see, device, uh, so wireless, do you want to talk about wireless? Yeah, sure. So for the wireless, um, for any wireless implementation, there are two major concerns. One is, of course, coverage, right? You want access wherever you are, in, the, in this case, in the common areas. Uh, but also here we have, or any convention, you have a problem that is user density. So I can put one access point here, and it's going to cover this whole huge space. But uh, once we have a lot of people, um, it goes away really fast. So technology evolved a lot uh, on the wireless market and wireless devices. The things that you still limited to certain number of users that are going to share that one access point. So then it comes to the to the user density is going. <clears throat> A way to, the only way to solve that is that you're going to need more access points. And once you have more access points, they're going to start seeing each other, and they're going to start in, interfering with each other. And that's not good either. Uh, so wireless, in the US, usually we use uh, channels 1, 6, and 11. Uh, that's what we should use. And so if you have more than three APs in the same place, um, they're going, to, they're going to interfere with each other. So it's good to have a solution that deals with that automatically. Uh, the other problem that we had in the, I was going to say in the past, but we still have some funny things happening, is device comp compatibility. Um, this used to happen a lot. Uh, for the past few years, it didn't happen. But last year, and I think we're going to talk a little bit about that, uh, we had an issue with iPads, and uh, it came back this year. Uh, once it came to, you put that in sleep mode, wouldn't come back. So you had to, there was a workaround for that. But again, it's always like it takes like a couple people to say, oh, I can't get on the network. Uh, we hear that really fast and we try to fix it. All right. Uh, the other problem we have is time. 
I mean, we, we do not have an infinite amount of time. We have um, basically three to four days to do setup. We're here for a week on site. Um, we have lots and lots of gear that we bring with, either gets thrown on in a car or gets shipped from someplace. Um, all of us come from across the country and maybe even outside of the country. We have two Canadians here up on stage who can represent, right? Hey. Um, we're a team of 10 people, essentially, that you know, work throughout the year. We'll have a, like a pre-con meeting where we'll come out to the hotel and make sure everything's the same, make sure things are working, um, and then just do things over email every once in a while or, or have a conference call. Um, the team's kind of broken up into the infrastructure, which is Mac and I, the Wi-Fi, which is Louise, Eric, and Heather, uh, and then the video, which is Derek, and then we've got the two managers, so Heather and Locke as well. So. And the ground pounders. All right. Don't forget about our ground pounders. They're pretty critical. What, what? Don't ground forget about support. the ground support. They're pretty critical. Yeah. Yeah, you got to have the bean counters. <laughs> Um, all right, so th this is the map, essentially, right? This is all the areas that we have to cover. Um, and we weren't really expecting, I think, that we were, we were going to be able to do the Reg Desk or the uh, Schweig area, just from the perspective that we hadn't gotten requests for it. Um, and Penn & Teller Theater, I think, was that also? It was the last minute. Yeah. Think, yeah. So it, it, we kind of had to scrounge this year because we were expecting X and we got X plus. But, you know, we, we do with what we can. Um, and this is a lot of ground to cover. If you look at this map, it's, it's a fairly large space. Uh, it's covering, this is like five or six IDFs, right? Uh, three, four, five, six. Uh, six IDFs, one catwalk space, and one, uh, sorry, one uh, under theater space and one uh, cable TV head in space. So we had to put equipment into switches and all those nine yeah. different cabinets. Yeah. And IDF uh, is inner inner domain feed, right? There. Uh, I've always inner had it as intermediate distribution frame there you go. versus master uh, Israeli local defense force? Israeli <laughs> defense force. Basically it, it's a wire it's a telco cabinet or sorry, telco closet or where you know where you drop all of your network, or so all of your wall drops come back to what is considered an IDF, and then that will link up to uh, a central IDF, which is usually called the master. So. And it, this year we didn't have to work through uh, any bathrooms to get to ours. Yeah. <laughs> I still wish we had better pictures from that one. Though. Yeah. There, there is a IDF in the bathroom in the RIV. It's awesome. Yeah. Like, oh, this is where our equipment, oh, that's, never mind. Anyway, uh, so this is kind of basically the structure of the network. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because it's a really busy slide and you're not going to be able to see anything. Um, but at least gives you a concept of this, is, this was pre-putting uh, the stuff in place. Post is a little different because we had to do some workarounds, but it's almost where we're, we're at right now. Uh, this is a map of where all the access points are, essentially. Uh, do you want to talk about this one a little bit, Louise? Um, what is important here to see is that we cannot, so we have tools that say this is the optimal uh, location for the access points according to RF logic and uh, whatever the smart people put into softwares that calculate that. Um, but of course we depend on many things including where the drops are, uh, how how high we can put the access points and all that stuff. So this might not look optimal, but that's how we have it. And then we deal with in configuration with basic rates and transmit rates and all that good stuff uh, to make number one coverage uh, work all over the place, as you can see on that one, and also avoiding in interference and um, Roaming, because roaming is quite important, right? You start, you, sh you turn on your device here in this room and you're going to be walking around. You don't want to drop whatever you're doing on your, on your device, so that's important. Okay. Uh, here's a graph that we just pulled at about 2 o'clock today. Um, as you can see, we did peak at some point on our 100 meg connection. Um, 
There's two two pretty pretty big spikes there. And apparently last night y'all went out and partied. Because you can see that there's a big traffic drop. <laughs> All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about what worked for us in this space. Um, we'll talk also a little bit about what we have to improve on. But so secure Wi-Fi. I think does everybody like the secure Wi-Fi? Yes. All right. So I mean, you can thank Louise, Eric, Locke those guys for setting all that stuff up. Locke actually did the Radius database back end, and the, the, I think uh, Tease also did the front end for that, so you could go in and enter in credentials off-site. Um, we actually have that server living here, and then you know, when we pop up our internet connectivity, that's what you're talking to is directly into our network on that, that machine. Um, <clears throat> I think it's very important that, that we have that, because it allows for some sense of uh, privacy, um, I mean, from the perspective that we don't actually ship those VLANs off to the wall of sheep. Um, we made that conscious, conscious decision last year. We, we basically said, all right, if we're going to give people a secure network, there's got to be some semblance that there's an understanding that it's secure, which means that, yeah, maybe you have POP3 still enabled. Maybe you have to telnet to a router. Maybe you have to do something like that. Um, but we don't want the wall of sheep to, get, to grab it. It's, it's just the well, wrong thing to do. We don't want to give it explicitly to the wall of sheep, I think is the, the best way to put it. Because, I mean, the, the traffic, once it leaves our, our uplink, is going across the internet. Anyone can man in the middle of it at that point. But we're not going to explicitly go out of our way and do it you know, at the beginning. We want to make sure you have some semblance. It's still up to you to secure probably end to end, just from the standpoint of, you don't know who, out is, who else is out on the internet, so you do need to protect yourself. But we're going to do what we can in that space. And, and the other thing that we've done is we've disallowed peer-to-peer -peer traffic. So if you get on the Wi-Fi, you're only going to see the MAC address of the firewall and the access points that you're talking to. You're not going to be able to see anybody else's traffic. You're not going to be able to map other people on the network because you only have internet outbound. Does that make sense? It's a good thing. I mean, it, 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 it's how we're trying to protect people from, from getting pwned. I mean, that's why you don't use the open Wi-Fi. So we just you can to actually use the, use the open Wi-Fi. You're more than welcome to check all your email and do all your banking on the open Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> the wall of sheep gets that traffic. So does everybody else around you. <laughs> exactly. Yes, fire sheep, right? Anyway. Uh, internet connection, 100 meg, we covered that. Did anybody realize that we had IPv6? Yeah? yeah? All right. Has anybody Here's gone to an IPv6 site? <laughs> no. Yeah. Fail. No, it, I'm just kidding. You know, from, from what we saw, you know, 0.2% of you did something with IPv6, um, that, which actually mirrors the rest of the uh, general internet traffic, so that's not too surprising. <laughs> but. Once the pirate base switches over, everybody will, the traffic will go up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that is true. We should talk to them about that one. <laughs> so uh, what was the, we were tunneling at outbound, right? Yeah, we, we were using a tunnel broker, or sorry, tunnel with tunnel broker slash Hurricane Electric. So That's good company. If you want to do your own IV, IPv6 stuff, go with them. Uh, let's see, the Wi-Fi was updated. We had a software update on the controller that um, allowed us to do some good stuff. Um, we were able to extend the network out with just a couple of access points using some mesh protocols. Uh, we, where was it? To Starbucks, basically? Yeah, we tried to go to all the way to the casino, but it really didn't work. So. Well, there, there were some issues that the casino didn't really care for that too much either. <laughs> no Wi-Fi is when you gamble. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. It'd be nice to sit in a casino and drink a beer and be well, we, how much we'll, money uh, lost. We'll see what our expansion limit is for next year. Yeah. Uh, so, big thing, DCTV to the hotel rooms. Um, do you want to talk about that, Derek? Sure. All right. So, um, yeah, it's been a few years since we've had DCTV in the hotel rooms just because uh, in the Riviera we didn't have access to their cable TV head end. So, uh, we really missed that and obviously a lot of people got sore feet over it. So. 
uh, we were really happy to be able to get back in there again this year. But we're still at a challenge, and that was we had to pipe video um, like you know over a mile of cable effectively. So the systems we were using before, which were analog balance, weren't going to work um, because you just get a big blob of noise at the end and no audio. So this year we're running uh, IPv4, uh, sorry, uh, MPEG4 over IP uh, over a fiber trunk to the head end. Um, now, the equipment to do this stuff is crazy expensive at the professional level, so we're actually using some, uh, again, eBay finds, really inexpensive uh, MPEG-4 and AAC encoders that are designed for video surveillance. Um, and uh, we ran into some challenges actually finding decoding equipment that would play it back on the other end, and those challenges came up right near the end. So uh, again, thanks to SOK for supplying us with some scan converters that allowed us to retrofit what we brought uh, to actually get the other end at the cable TV head end working. Um, but uh, with five channels, uh, it would have been, I think it's $3,000 for the two ends of the encoders for a professional level equipment. So you know, $15,000 budget for DCTV, uh, that wouldn't have gone over well. So instead we did it for basically a shoestring budget and I think it worked out pretty good. Yeah, the, I mean the original uh, plan was to use PlayStation 3s actually as the decoders. And, uh, we found out, unfortunately, once they have a network in between them, they started crapping out after about three to five minutes of streaming. So we were scrambling trying to find boxes that we could run this stuff on, and, and basically Derek re-engineered it at the last minute and got it working. Um, you know, our, our plan was to have a little bit more content on the TV channels, but unfortunately we had to forego that just to get the feeds there for now. So We were literally plugging them in during the first talk wandering around here. So as as people were arriving in, we were plugging it in. So that's how close we cut it with DCTV this year. <laughs> the, finding the servers to plug in as well, since we didn't have the PlayStations, we had to scramble to get computers. So now my work laptop is up in the CATV head end. Uh, I can't get it back without uh, a guy who's licensed by the Gaming Commission, I think, to actually unplug it from their network. Uh, and uh, same thing, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Mac, but uh, his uh, his torrent server, which he was going to have using this wonderful bandwidth, is now serving videos too. So he doesn't get any new television to watch when he goes back home. So you can thank these guys for giving up their laptops so you can have TV in your room. <laughs> hey. All right. So we also had workshops. I don't know if anybody heard about that. Yeah, he's fine. He's fine. It's just hungover. over. It's DEF CON. What do you expect? <laughs> he actually works. Trust me. Which is why he's now sleeping. Yeah. No, no, let it go. He's snoring. I can hear him, hear him snoring. It's All right. Not coming good, out good. Mind. He's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're we up. We tend to party just as hard as you do, so. <laughs> and go to work every morning. Yeah, we have to get up at 8. Our call is at 8, so sometimes that's pretty. Sometimes it's eight. I'm a slave sometimes. driver. Yeah. yeah, they're both slave drivers. I don't know how they do it. <laughs> oh, that's right. They go to bed at 10. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, when I'm I leave here, I go on kidding. vacation. That's not true. Just, just one night. <laughs> So workshops, we had workshops, so we had to deploy some switches there. Um, that was new to us, kind of a new, new thing, which I think will be good. I think we'll see what we can do. Maybe we'll have more stuff going on there. All right. Uh, issues, PoE. We bought a bunch of PoE switches uh, off of eBay. Unfortunately, they are Cisco proprietary Sorry. PoE switches. We got some power injected switches, not some PoE. Or sorry, power inline switches, not PoE. Yeah. We have IP phones, but no access points. That yeah. wouldn't help. Yeah. So we could run Cisco IP phones on them all day long, but not not wireless access points that are to the 802.3 AF spec. You said iOS devices. I heard Cisco iOS. I don't know what you were talking about. No one told me Apple. <laughs> <laughs> Um, apparently, overnight, the DHCP stopped working. We're not sure about that. We're going to look into that. So that's an issue to figure out if someone was dosing it or not. We don't know. To, so. to be fair, people were at parties. No one should be on overnight last night. So it's fine. Like I said, you know, everybody's out drinking. Uh, PS3, as we talked about, um, new infrastructure. Yeah, new hotel, just having to figure out exactly what hooks up. A lot of the time, sight unseen, et cetera, et cetera. 
and the and normal challenges that come with a casino hotel. Um, fortunately, uh, the good hotels have their infrastructure designed so that the convention services area is actually a, a purely separate network from the hotel and casino side. And this, uh, this hotel is no exception. They have their network very well separated. Yeah. <coughs> There's also, well, anyway. Uh, Wi-Fi penetration, so just being able to penetrate into the spaces. I think there's some potential dead zones, but you know, as we figure that out, we're going to get better at, okay, we need more access points, or maybe we need to put access points in, in key areas so that people get a consistent signal. So. Yeah, we planned for the signal to bleed over to the walkway there, to the hallway, and it didn't do as well as we thought, so that's something to get better next year. I think it's the big giant metal shield on yeah, the corner. Yeah, no, I'm looking at it. <laughs> cage. Something about an RF cage, Faraday cage. Yeah. All right. So now is the A and Q, right? We give answers, you ask questions. I was going to say. Anybody, uh, there's a microphone up front here. If people want to come up and, and ask a question. I don't know if it's up or. or don't all rush up at once. Or though. just yell it out. We'll, we'll repeat the questions if they're not on mic. Don't worry about it. Uh, yeah, I'm curious uh, what the cost is for the internet access for the duration of the event, and who actually are you paying? The hotel, an ISP? What are some numbers there? Heather? Um, actually, I don't have the contracted price in front of me, and that happened months ago. But um, it is done through the hotel. The hotel already has that bandwidth um, set aside. And uh, they bill based Ballpark. on... Ballpark. I'm not asking to the penny. It was... I, honestly, I don't have it right now. It was mixed in with a bunch of other contract stuff months ago. So I do apologize. But um, that is actually bandwidth that the hotel has for all conventions. We can go up to 200 meg on that bandwidth. Uh, beyond that, they would need to bring in additional. But. Super quick question. Uh, on the diagrams you had up there, you had a really cool application to map out the wireless ranges. What is that called? I think that, go ahead, Louise. It is embedded on the Aruba system. So it's called RF plan. And you just throw there like the size and all the. Is it open for other AP types or just that? No, no, no. It's specific for their AP So the, the controller itself has a management interface and that's where it's actually pulling that from. You oh, go yeah. in and you go, all right place all the APs, where we told them to put them right, and put them on that map. So nice. it, it allows us to import a, a map, essentially, into yeah. that. So. It takes all of the fun out of the job. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Quick favor, can you guys move the line over right up here, please? No, you're We're good. not the TSA, not we're you. cool. Just yeah, it's cool. <laughs> it's the video camera behind yeah, you. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're doing this the wrong way. We're supposed to use the Q&A room, but it, stuff starts at 6.30, so it's kind of weird. Shh. Hush, go. Uh, not really a question, just a comment for consideration for next year. Yes, uh, You guys mentioned that you have a lot of equipment that you transport out here. Possibly a solution to save on transportation costs if it's just equipment that you only use once a year. Uh, just get a local climate controlled facility. Yeah, we have talked about that and um, uh, for some things that will work, uh, but we do have the challenge of having to pre-configure and test and update and do update that sort of thing. Um, this year we actually, there's three of us that came out Saturday night and uh, we had already pre-configured a lot of the equipment and updated a lot of the equipment to, for instance, work with IBV6 and give us the additional features that we needed. Um, so we do a lot of that kind of remotely, so it would be hard to do that in, um, in a storage situation, but for some of our equipment, we are considering. Yeah, I mean, cables and stuff we don't need to necessarily haul out, but we need to update firmwares and whatnot. Um, just wanted to see if you guys had any recommendations for uh, a newbie setting up an 802.1x network uh, on the cheap, I guess. <laughs> for 802.1x, what, on the server side or? The whole thing, well, we actually use, today, any enterprise or not really enterprise type of uh, solution supports 802.1x, WPA, WPA2 with 802.1x authentication. You can get, we use free radius. You can use free radius, and sometimes it's, could be a pain in the butt to configure, but it's well documented, actually, these days for the most, for the commonly used okay. applications. All right, so I've, I have two. Um, one, I was just curious for the wireless stuff. 
it, uh, like in the program, and like you guys mentioned, it goes straight from the like wireless to the firewall. Is that just by way of VLANs? Because you said they have like uh, access point isolation, so like two clients can't talk to each other, or do you have some fancy stuff like L2TP tunnels or anything like that? There are two. So for each AP, we have two ESSIDs. Each ESSID on each AP has one VLAN. So if you hop in AP1, you jump on the secure network. Uh, once you run to another AP, you're going to be on another VLAN. And then internally, all the traffic is actually um, uh, encapsulated mm -hmm. through GRE okay. from the AP to the controller. The controller makes decisions as for what VLAN that user belongs and what policies we do. And we actually bridge everything up to the firewall. Okay. So all the routing is done on the firewall. Very cool. Uh, the second one is, since you guys mentioned it, I actually fired up TCP dump on my phone, which usually does IPv6. Uh, I didn't actually receive any RAs. So I Are you on the secure or on the... Yeah, secure. Yeah, probably on the secure. You're not going to see anything yeah. because that's the whole idea. Because on top of it, well, on top of the VLAN... I, I was going to say, for the, R, the RA, the RA you should have been seeing. That comes from the, yeah, the firewall it. side. Yeah, so I that... Um, I mean, I was seeing it plenty on our, on our stuff, so... I, we were having better, I was seeing better RA um, pack, you know, f uh, traffic coming float through than from the DHCP just because of the way V6 does its address allocation. So uh, I'm curious um, if we could see it afterwards. We'll talk. Sure. All right, cool. Thank you. Um, just one thing um, regarding uh, traffic management, traffic shaping, have you guys played, or played around at all with? Um, dynamic percentage based per MAC traffic shaping at all, or uh, is it just not, raw, uh, FIFO? I was going to say, not per MAC. Um, no. We do have outbound traffic shaping on the firewall. Um, we tend to give priorities to HTTP, SSH. So it's you know, protocol based, right? It's protocol based, based, yeah, at the firewall level, not anything at a station level or, you know, for MAC. Okay. Are you asking us if we want to prioritize our traffic? I'm just. <laughs> oh no 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 no! I, it was it was just because I've been investigating some of that for you know when bottleneck uh, alleviation. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, couple couple things. One, uh, it seems to me the equipment you're using is not exactly specialized for DEF CON. Uh, have you considered uh, maybe working with uh, UNLV or a community college in the area? to have them uh, maybe split cost for equipment uh, with them. They use it during the year. DEF CON isn't during the traditional school year. Maybe you guys can take the equipment then, um, something like that. So part of that comes down to whatever negotiations and contracts we can do with those individuals. And I don't know if we have any particular relationship with UNLV in particular, but it's an idea. One of the things we have been avoiding in the last few years is getting any kind of specific vendor promised or any specific relation promise that is not ours because given the timing, given the pre-config and given, you know, this resource allocation, like if we, if all of a sudden they decided they didn't want to let us use it one year and we're borrowing equipment, we're really in the hole for that. Or if so we try to make reason, sure those are good. If there's a political reason they didn't want to give us the equipment. I mean, <clears throat> it's a it's a really great idea, but we are a hacking conference. Yeah. Right? yeah. Well, I mean, if you owned a share in the equipment, that might kind of cut the legs out from under him sure. as far as holding back goes. Uh, and the second question I had is that guy still breathing? Yeah, he is. Oh, yeah. Okay. No. <laughs> he fought the good fight. He's had a very long week, but yeah. he's been up in the morning and helping us out every day. So. Hi. Um, do you guys offer any type of uh, service consultation or anything to the host hotel to help mitigate some of the computer malfunctions that uh, might be happening during the conference? Uh, no comment. No. Uh, nothing... uh, typically, we don't. Yeah. I mean, unless they come to us and say, "Hey, we're having a problem." Um, yeah. Do they ever do that? We did. What's with, that? We did with the Riv. They did ask us to for whatever reason, block outbound connections from us to the RIV websites, yeah. for instance. So it's a delicate line when working with the hotel that we, you know, there's some back and forth, but when they ask for something, we, you know, we see what we can do. Yeah. Um, but typically it, it's the, we're segmented off. You know, if you think something's happening at, in the network because of us, then, you know, we can talk about that specifically, but we are segmented <laughs> off. It can only come out through our head end. So we, we have an idea of what's going on there. 
Okay. Uh, this is very different from uh, what we experienced at the Alexis Park where we pretty much owned their entire network and would come in and they, I mean, it was great. Uh, from the perspective, at the time, we were very small, or well, smaller. And uh, we were able to go in there and just sort of take over the network and do what we needed to do. And, you know, now we're dealing with a much larger network, much larger, you know, venue. And, and then the whole issue between the casino, uh, the casino gaming issues and the and the convention center, so it's a, it's a totally different ball game now. But we do, um, we have meetings throughout DEFCON. We're constantly in contact with hotel management. Um, we, we have very open communication about what's going on and what they're experiencing. And um, while we don't out and out offer to help secure their network per se, uh, we do make ourselves available for questions. And if they do need something, um, you know, they know we're willing to help. Okay. Yep. Thanks, and thanks for all you do. Thanks. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. I um, just had a question. You guys showed some graphs and metrics. Do you guys keep track of that and make it publicly available? Yeah, yeah. you can actually see it on uh, uh, defconnetworking.org. Okay. Yep. Great. Thank you. Yeah, we usually will put together a presentation and then put all those graphs up afterwards. Yep. The graphs are actually up already. Oh, okay. Yep. Some of them. Uh, most of us eventually made it back to our hotel rooms, and when you flip through the TV, we basically saw the desktop of your laptops or machines <laughs> or whatever sitting yeah. there. I don't know if you record those, but it would, be, would it be possible to record the talks and then like queue them all up and like for the talks for the day, just play them in a loop at night? You mean like a PVR? Um, yeah, right. <laughs> well, actually, so the situation is such that um, we can't do that partially because the, the talks are recorded and sold. And also because uh, with this hotel, we have agreed not to replay talks uh, due to, since we're putting on a cable system that we can't lock down. That means anybody who's in the hotel can see those talks. So by not replaying them, we're providing them with a sort of plausible deniability. Yep, they said something in the talk that the customer didn't like, but it's not being replayed. So. Okay. Yes, yep. they asked us if the, the speakers wouldn't swear. We yeah. said we cannot. <laughs> <laughs> this was, this was our no compromise. <laughs> way. Well, what made me think about it, I, I was, had to do some work, and I was sitting there flipping through the channels waiting for stuff to happen, and I yep. watched part of Jeopardy. And actually, and I'm thinking, like, if other people in the hotel who have nothing to do with DEF CON are sitting there watching Jeopardy, we might as well show them something more informational. That, yeah. You know, yeah. It was fun, but, yeah. you, know, you know. Now, next year, we're looking at... Um, you know, putting something in between the talks as well so that there's not that, you know, the VLC desktop sitting on the screen in between the talks. But again, this year, uh, while we did get DCTV up and it was, um, you know, it was a, a win, uh, it was still a challenge. So we, we were working with what we could. Okay. Look out for next year because it'll be better. Okay. Hi guys, uh, I was wondering if you guys um, were planning to put up maybe like documentation of how you guys did the things you did or maybe some like best practices uh, for people that want to set up, you know, uh, in other environments that are hostile as well. I don't know if best practices is the right term to use on this network. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we've, uh, we've been debating about it. Well, not really debating about it. We've been lazy about it for a few years. Um, this year I did like for particularly the firewall configs, the switch configs, those are actually stored in a Git repository. Once I scrub it, I'm going to make, uh, make it available on GitHub, um, scrub it and get some sign offs on it. I want to make sure everyone's cool on it. But yeah, we're going to be putting that together and putting it available. So check out defconnetworking.org and uh, we should have some stuff up there hopefully in a couple weeks. All right. and thanks for all you do. Thanks. No problem. Thank you. I said uh, one thing that would have been, I mean, I don't know if it's doable or not, but uh, with the TV, it'd be kind of cool if we could, if we had like the PowerPoints in the corner as they're speaking. Yeah. And I mean, I know it's obviously probably a big so, challenge and more to get through, mixed. But. Yeah. Well, actually, what we, we, we actually wanted to do that, we wanted to combine some of that stuff. Uh, it's an equipment challenge that we weren't ready to face this year. We may have a time and planning to actually do that next year. So yes, we Thank agree. You. We actually wanted to switch it over to just the PowerPoints, but again, we'd have to have scan converters and stuff that we didn't have hardware access to. So. If, if we hadn't had the challenges that we did have, I think there was a pretty good chance we would have gotten to doing that this year, but we just ran out of time and we would have been changing things halfway through the talks if we did. Two quick, two quick questions. Um, I hear you use PF firewall, is that correct? 
Yes. I think you're specifically in charge of it. Um, is it fair to say that you think the same of PF, a GUIs like PF sense in the same sense that a lot of IP tables folks think of IP tables GUIs? Is it, is it kind of looked down upon uh, over just PF itself mm. from the command line? Uh, is it one big so PF? In a lot of ways, it depends on the tool you have, or depends on your level and the tool you have. Thanks. We're pretty comfortable with a lot of the interfaces, and we do a lot of things that the interfaces don't necessarily want to do, so we need to be able to customize it. Um, but so again, so tools like PFSense are good for a, yeah. uh, an end user type person, um, but when they get into our realm, we've got 200 VLANs, which would all have really goofy rules defined on it. I mean, if you go in and actually do a, a listing of the PF rule set on a PFSense box, there's things that they do, uh, things that rules that they put in there to, to make it easy so you don't stomp on yourself, you know, screw yourself up, essentially. Mm -hmm. We don't want that. We want full control of it. Um, yeah. so we, we screw ourselves a lot. Yeah, you want to shoot yourself yeah we, we do it just yeah. fine without having to have a GUI to troubleshoot. So, um, but... We're done. We're done? Yeah, so... Uh, we're going to... Uh, but PF is much better than IP tables. Yeah, PF's good. All right, real fast, we're going to sneak it in. Um, we want to hear your feedback. We want to know what you think, you know, what improvements you want to see, et cetera, et cetera. So at least I'm going to be available. I know a couple other people are going to be available over there for at least a little bit. If we have to, we'll move to the real track one Q&A space. So come talk to us. And you can always email knock at defconnetworking.org, too, with your questions and feedback. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Yep.